I'm going to introduce Art Fuller, and Art, you can go ahead and screen share. Um, Art is uh, a master gardener of, of great standing here in, in Cowlitz County. Um, certainly has, and if you've seen it, you know, with a lot of experience in terms of um, working with uh, plants and that. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Art. Art, thank you so much for uh, speaking tonight. Uh, thanks a lot, Gary. Thanks for having me. What a great group tonight. I wasn't expecting this many. It's like a packed house. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to cover a lot of things about pruning and why you need to prune and how important pruning is and what it helps and what it prevents. And we're just going to cover topics galore on pruning. The reason I got so interested in pruning, we moved up to Washington in 2005. And I was in the Navy at the time. And as I, I didn't see the property until I got back from a deployment, I got here in December, walked around the property, which is about five acres, and the, the apple trees in the orchard were never pruned from the time they were planted. So I didn't know anything about pruning. So I just went back and forth and did my Navy stuff, and I retired in 2012, got home and decided to become a master gardener because I didn't know how to take care of the property. So once I saw how to take care of the property and how easy pruning was, I jumped right in and started pruning the trees around the property. And once you get them pruned and once you get them under control, it is phenomenal what happens to those trees. So we're going to start here. And these are the topics we're going to cover. And a lot of these we're just going to briefly cover. So we're going to cover climate. Uh, briefly hit legal issues, uh, planning, variety selection, rootstock, site selection, and planting, irrigation, pruning, fertilizing, fruit thinning, weed management, vertebrae pests, and harvesting and handling. So a lot of, a lot of topics we're going to cover. And we're going to get in a little bit about grafting also as we're going through some of this stuff when we talk about rootstock, but not very much. So Western Washington, there's a lot of great things that happen in Western Washington, especially for growing fruit trees. The coastal maritime climate, we don't have very heavy or very uh, cold, wet. We got wet winters, but not very cold winters. So that's very nice. We do have wet springs. And sometimes wet winters, like we do right now, we're getting a lot of rainfall right now. And the very dry summers. And the neat thing about Washington, there are so many microclimates. And what I mean by microclimates is all the hills, um, there's walls, there's trees that block wind. There's all kinds of things that create a microclimate on your property. The legal aspect as you're growing orchards, you are responsible to make sure that the insects stay on your property, which is hard to do, but you got to take care of them and make sure that they do not go to other people's property and wipe out their crop. That's about all we're going to cover on legal aspects. There's a lot of limiting factors that happen. Our average temperature throughout the year, this is Collets, so you'd have to look up for your individual uh, city you live in and just check out what your um, average temperatures are. But as you can see, in the January, February, uh, all the way until the May time frame, it's pretty chilly, and that starts warming up. And then around the September, October time frame, it starts cooling down. And then the other big aspect we're going to hit into is rainfall. Rainfall is just phenomenal here. So January all the way into the June, we'll, we'll say May time frame, we're getting quite a bit of rain. And then from September all the way up to December, it's going to pick back up again. That June, July, and August, it stays pretty dry. And these two graphs here are, are collets. Most fruit trees require 150 frost-free days. In Collets County, we're very lucky. 
So there's approximately 197 frost-free days. Now when I'm talking about planting, when you're getting into variety selection, rootstock selection, pollination requirements, you need to plan where this tree is going to be planted at. You want to make sure you have full sun. You want to make sure you have good air circulation. You want to make sure that the soil is good. You want to make sure that there's good drainage. There's all kinds of things that take into a, uh, effect that will affect your trees. So you want to make sure you plan. Go to the drawing board, figure out your plan, figure out where you want to put your trees before you go buy them. Figure out the type of tree and figure out where you want to put it before you put it there. I can't stress the planning part of it. Don't go to the magic eight balls and don't go out to, to the gypsy lady down the street to find out where to put this stuff or what to buy. And just be really careful when you buy trees from different things. Make sure you go to like a nursery or somebody that's respectable that can give you exact information about the tree that you're planting. Variety selection is very important. It's going to greatly depend on your location and you've got to know your conditions before you select. Apple trees, as we know, there are many, many varieties of apples. There's all the way from the the sour apples to the sweet apples and anything in between. Cherries, you want to pick by fruit flavor is the key. And what you want to do with the cherry tree. Pears, you got European and you got Asian. Stone fruits, you have to be careful with stone fruits because they're susceptible to disease in western Washington. Nuts, you got hazelnuts, walnuts, and chestnuts. We have, a, we have a walnut tree on our property that's probably about 50, maybe 50 years old. And it's, I can't prune it. It's luckily, walnuts don't need that prune, that much pruning. However, it just gives me a ton of walnuts. A little bit about sign wood and rootstock. Sign wood is the part of the tree that's above the ground and it's above the graft. You can, this is an important thing here because we're going to be starting to prune our apple trees from January through February is the time to prune apple trees and pear trees. So if you're going to prune your trees, what I usually do if I want to make grafting from it, what I want to do is as I prune, I want to take, if I can get up there. I want to take the pruning and I want to make the cuts on the limbs, and then I want to wrap those uh, end pieces, and I want to stick those into a, I want to wrap them in a paper towel, wet paper towel, put them into a Ziploc bag, and put them in the refrigerator. And I'll store them all the way until March till I can graft. Rootstock is the bottom portion that makes up the root and the collar. The important thing about rootstock is the rootstock has to be compatible to the desired tree. And there's some pictures of the, the sign wood and where the rootstock takes over. And there's one more important thing to remember when you're looking at grafted trees by seedlings. A tree that has grown from a seed is grown on seedling rootstock. So it's basically just a seed. So when you plant that seed, it's going to go to 100% of the tree height. That's important stuff. Okay, Gary, we're ready for that first survey question. Okay, this is a question. What determines the height of the tree? Rootstock, sign wood. All you have to do is click on your answer, submit it, and nobody knows who's uh, submitting what. It's a completely, uh, nobody sees who's uh, picking what answer. So go ahead and select your um, answer. We have 18 out of 34 that have pulled themselves. 
25. Couple more minutes. Okay. 10 seconds. All right. Okay, 76% said rootstock, 24% said sign wood. The answer is rootstock. Rootstock is the one that determines the height of the tree. Okay, rootstock grafting. The important part of the rootstock is the rootstock will let the fruit trees to bear the fruit earlier. So as you're growing this, you're going to graft it onto the rootstock, and the sign wood is going to take off and start growing. So rootstock plants also determine. And there's where your answer is. True and root system size. Root yield efficiency. To actively repair and strengthen enamel. Longevity of the plant, resistant to pests and disease, also helps in cold hardiness, and trees' ability to adapt to soil types. Okay, an apple tree growing from seed from a seedling is going to grow to approximately 30 feet. So you want to make sure you know your labels when you're going to buy trees that are, have been grafted. So we're going to cover some of these trees and the different types of rootstock that you can see in the different numbers. Um, usually when you buy a tree, you'll see a number on there. It'll say like an M7, an M11, an M27. These numbers really don't tell you anything unless you know what you're looking at. So we're going to cover some of this stuff and see what it, what it actually means. So if you see an M111, that tree, if you bought that tree on that type of rootstock, is going to go to approximately 90% of the height of the seedling, so approximately 27 feet high. When you're getting up into age, you don't want to be climbing trees or trying to get in there to start pruning trees, so you want to try to keep them down smaller. If you see a 106, MM106, that's another type of rootstock. That tree will grow to 60 to 75 percent, or 18 to 22.5 feet high. M7 is the one I like to use the most. That's usually what they consider a semi-dwarf, or a G30. Those grow to 55 to 65 percent height of the tree, usually about 16 to 19 feet. M26, G11, 40 to 50 percent of height of the tree, 12 to 15 feet. M9, these are getting into the small range, 6.9, almost 7 feet to 10.5 feet. And the smallest one of the bunch is the M27. These ones are used for containers, 25 percent of the height, usually about 6 foot tall, 7 foot tall, maximum. So these are just for apple trees. This is only on apple trees that you'll see these numbers. And here's what they're going to look like as they're growing on the different rootstocks. Now we're going to get into a little bit of other fruits and nuts on dwarfing rootstocks also. Okay, pear trees. A standard pear tree can grow up to 18 to 20 feet and 12 to 13 feet wide. So there's going to be different rootstocks for pear trees. Plums, oh, there's a wide variety of rootstocks. Peaches usually grow from seed. Cherries are grown on their own on different types of rootstock also, and we'll cover both of those. Okay, pear rootstock. As you're looking at these, I grafted a pear tree and an apple tree so far. And I did these back in 2006, 
16 and the 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 apple tree is probably about seven seven foot tall now and I put it on a um, a semi dwarf so it's going to get up to about the 15 16 foot mark and this last year was the first time I had apples on that tree so I knew I did okay on the I've only grafted two trees in my life and those were the first two but I had a good instructor at um, Rain, Rain Tree Nursery holds a grafting workshop and I went to that and that's where I grafted these two I grafted a pear tree on a quince which is the second one over on this uh, chart right here that we're looking at and I grafted the uh, Liberty Apple so they 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 were both on uh, dwarf semi dwarf root stocks, so they're not going to get very tall. But here's your pear root stock, and the sizes they're going to get to. And here's your cherry root stock. Everybody's got to put different numbers on everything, so it just makes it very confusing when you go to look for stuff. But if you're going to a nursery. If you ask the nursery what the, the rootstock means, they can probably tell you exactly what it means. Or else just look it up. Uh, take a picture of it or Google it while you're there, and you should find it online very easily. Pollination, a lot of trees are not self-fruitful, so you have to have pollinators. And in order to get the fruit, you have to have pollination occurring. So self-fruitful, each flower can be pollinated within the, uh, the tree itself. So they are, if you have blossoms on your tree, the blossoms from that tree can pollinate other blossoms on the tree. So that's what self-fruitful means. Unself or, uh, yeah, self-unfruitful means that the, plow, the flowers have to be pollinated from another fruit variety. So this chart is from Washington State University, and this tells you the di different types of apples that pollinate other types of apples. So all you have to do is just cross-reference and go right down the line. You can see what kind of apple trees you have to plant for pollination. Art? Yes. Um, for those people that like the reference, if you look in the chat box, the reference is there. If you just copy it or hit it, it will take you to the website so that you have that. Um, Alice put that there. Just wanted okay. to pass that along. All right. Great. Thanks. And at the very end of the topic, I've got all the references that I've got the information that I took all this information from. So that's also at the very end of this uh, topic that we have. Thanks, Alice. Okay, Gary, I think we're ready for the second uh, question. Okay, are flies pollinators? Yes or no? Very easy. Go ahead and answer. And then submit. People get pretty good. We're about, we've got 25 people that have responded. Okay, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right. Okay, 61% said yes, 39% said no. All right, I'm going to close, I'm going to bring this up right now. Pollinators, we're going to cover it real quick. So pollinators, we've got bats, honeybees, mason bees, bumblebees, beetles, hummingbirds, Birds, butterflies, flies, wind, rain, and many other insects. Also, you can self-pollinate by taking, if you really are having an issue, you can go out and take Q-tips and rub them on the blossoms and take it to each blossom. But I'd prefer having everybody else do the work for me. And here's a basic pollination syndrome character table. 
And this will tell you what each of those pollinators will do for the tree. This is also from Washington State University. And this PowerPoint is going to be up that other that people can look at also. Am I right, Gary? That's correct. So we do record all these. If you would like a copy or the connection for the recording, uh, send me an email tomorrow and just say I'd like the recording of the pruning workshop, and I'll send you that connection. All right. Thanks, Gary. Okay, site selection and planning. This is an important thing. If you're going to plant a fruit tree and you're starting from scratch, you have control where that tree goes. So you need to check and make sure that the site you're picking is compatible to the tree you're growing. So you're going to need any, most fruit trees all, always need full sun. Wind is very important. So it stops diseases, it gets good circulation, dries the tree from our wet climate we have here. You got to have water and you need room and well-drained soils. Okay, this, this next picture is going to show a little bit of different trees and how they're planted and the rooting system. You can see the difference on which rooting system is, or which tree is planted in the right spot by the rooting system. So the tree to the left is in the best, the tree to the right is in the worst. And that is all depending on the type of soil, the slope of the embankment the tree is planted on, and those are the two major factors of the tree's growth. And of course the sun and the wind is very important also. Site selection and planning. When you're digging the hole, make sure it's large enough. If you're buying a $5 tree, make sure the hole's at least $15, you know, for a $15 to $50 tree. I make the tree, I make the hole big enough so I can lay the roots completely out flat. And we're going to show on, the, on this picture coming up that we're going to show exactly how far down below the soil line you should go with the tree rooting system. Ensure the graft and sign would stay above the ground. Ensure the sides of the hole are not rough. We have clay here, a lot of clay. So as you're shoveling, you're making a vase or a pot. So you want to make sure you rough up those edges so the, the roots have an area to go through. Okay, the bump on the tree up above there, that's your graft. You never want to bury it. Ignore paint lines on the tree because that's usually done by the nursery. And you just lay the rooting system right on top. And the rooting system, the first roots are just below the soil line. But make sure these bottom roots got a place to go. Okay, next question, Gary. And this one, you can pick more than one answer. Yep, yep. What happens if the graft is buried? And it's multiple choice, and there's multiple answers. So go ahead and submit your answers, and let's see what we get. How are we doing, Gary? You got 23. We'll give it just a, a little bit more, and then I'm going to 10 seconds, and then I'll call it. All right. And okay, the rest of them are, are too afraid to do this. <laughs> just remember, it's anonymous. Nobody's picking over, peeking over your shoulder. Okay, I'm going to end it now.
right. There you go. All right. Okay, so 46% said the tree will grow to the size of the sign would. 79% said, 79% picked the sign would, would grow uh, roots. 68% said the tree will send shoots from the roots. 29% said the tree will still have the rootstock characteristics. All four of those answers are correct. That's what's going to happen. All those things can happen if you bury that graft. The tree will go to the size of the sign wood because right then after you buried that um, after you bury the rootstock, the sign wood is going to take over. The sign wood will grow roots. Yes, it will. The tree will send shoots up from the roots. That's correct. And the tree will still have the rootstock characteristics. That's also correct. All right, proper irrigation. Proper irrigation is important when you're planting new trees. You want to make sure they stay uh, watered, and you want to make sure they don't dry out on you. Ensure the root ball stays wet. Ensure as you plant, you give the, the new tree plenty to drink. I usually watch a, a tree I've planted and maintain a good watering system for that tree for about three years after that tree is planted. Up to five years, they say you got to watch it to make sure that it's getting enough water. So once the tree starts producing fruit, you know the roots have been established, you're doing everything correctly. Um, a couple more years later, it should be fine and it should take off on its own. Okay, proper irrigation is usually an Easter Was eastern Washington problem, not so much here on the west side of the Cascades. The key is when you plant, make sure it has a good drink of water when you plant it. You want to check the soil, grab a ball after you dig down about 12 to 24 inches. If, the, if you squeeze it, it crumbles, it's too dry. If it drips, it's too wet. During the summer is important because of our um, drought time frames. We want to make sure that those trees stay good and watered. You want to keep an eye on the, on the tree itself. You want to watch for wilting, leaf curl, anything like that. Premature leaf drop, those are all signs that the tree is needing water. And mature trees can use deep watering every seven to 14 days. I, I, my, my soil in my orchard stays pretty moist because of the shade it gets. And my trees don't need that much watering. But during the June and July time frame, June, July, and August time frame, I have a 200 or actually, a, yeah, it's 230 gallon tank up above uh, my orchard that I use for water during the summer. So I collect it off my roof, and I water that tree, the, my, my three trees, actually I got five trees. I got three that I bought and two that I grafted. I water those trees consistently during the summer, usually about once a week. I give them a good drink, about six gallons of water. You want to avoid, you want to avoid overwatering. Okay, this, this picture here is uh, bud growth as it's going through the different types of trees. So you want to sort of watch this as the tree is uh, blossoming out and as your fruit is starting to form. So while we're, tree, while we're pruning, the reasons we want to prune is we want to direct the growth of the tree. We want to maintain the health of the tree. Believe it or not, if you prune, it's going to increase fruit bearing potential. I can't stress this stuff enough. Walnuts produce on current season shoots. You're going to see this, this again. Hazelnuts, nectarines, peaches, quince, Japanese plums produce on previous season shoots. Some sour cherries, some apples, and some pears 
produce on previous seasons, spurs, and shoots. And then apples, apricots, sour, and sweet cherries. Pears and plums produce on long-lived spurs. So when you buy a tree, make sure you know the name of the tree. Look it up and find out what it's going to do. Now we're going to get into pruning and different types of cuts and why you want to what what the tree tells you on what to prune is is uh, great because the trees tell you what to do. There's four D's that you need to remember. It's kind of easy to remember. And on the right hand side, you'll see you have a sucker, a broken branch, branch, a water spout, um, interfering branch, and then double leaders. So the four D's damaged. So a damaged branch would be the broken branch number two. A dead branch, if it's dead, take it out. Disease, the same thing. If you see disease on it, tent caterpillars, anything like that, get rid of it. Dysfunctional is the big one because there's all types of uh, categories for dysfunctional. You have suckers, which is number one. Water sprouts, number three. Interfering branches, crossing, vertical, upward, downward. So if a branch is going up or if a branch is going down, take it, take the branch off. If it's crossing, going in across the, the main trunk of the tree, take it out. If a branch is rubbing another branch, remove it. Those are the important things to remember about the 4Ds in pruning. And the last one is the double leader up on top. You want to make sure you only have one leader. When you're tree pruning, it's important to have good tools. You want to make sure you have a good set of hand pruners. You want to make sure they're sharp. You want to make sure they're clean. You want to make sure you sterilize after each cut. Make sure they're bypass type clippers, pruners, or loppers. Do, I recommend don't using anvil because anvil ends up uh, crushing the branch. Okay, you can go into extension poles with saws and uh, pruners. You can use um, head shears, not so much for pruning trees, but chainsaws work great if you got trees like Roman with huge uh, suckers coming out. You want to use uh, regular bow saws and uh, pole saws work great and tree pruners. <clears throat> Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. You said you use alcohol between every cut when you're trimming an apple tree? <clears throat> Again? You use alcohol on your clippers between every cut when you're trimming a tree? It's a good practice to do that. You spray it with alcohol after a cut in case the branch is diseased so you don't spread the disease to other parts of the tree. And especially if you go from tree to tree. Okay. So, but if your tree is healthy, then it's not necessary. It's just a good practice. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, here's when you're when you're first planting your tree, you want to prune all fruit and nut trees at planting time. The best thing to do is once you plant it, you want to cut approximately 30 to 40 inches above the ground after that tree is planted. And the reason being is that's going to start your lower branches and the scaffolding. That's where they're going to start at. So if you cut at that 30 to 40 inch mark, that's where your scaffolding is going to start. And your branches are going to form and the tree is going to start working its way up. Prune young trees lightly, and heavy pruning will delay fruiting. Prune mature, mature trees heavily. Maximum amount of takeoff of a pruning tree is one-third. So if you start taking off the 4Ds, chances are by the time you're done with the 4Ds, You've probably taken off probably pretty close to one-third of the tree. 
And you want to prune the top heavier than the lower. Some more guidelines. Your, your scaffolding, that's your branches coming out, out of the tree. You want to um, ensure that they are between a 45 to 60 degree angle from the main branch going up. So as these trees are growing, you can um, tie them down, stake them down, and form them as they're growing to ensure that they get that angle. To keep trees small, prune moderately every year. And you always want to prune the majority of the time. If you want to do a heavy prune, you want to do it during the dormant season. There are some exceptions. You want to be careful when you're going with uh, cherries and Asian pears. Recommend pruning those in August because if you make a cut now on an Asian or a cherry, there's a good chance you, with this wet weather we have here in western Washington, you could um, introduce a bacterial infection to the tree. If you come to a large limb, you want to make sure you do a double cut so you don't end up shearing that uh, bark down as the, the branch oh. falls. And what I mean by a double cut is you can see the branch or you can see the main uh, trunk of the tree going up and then you want to do your first cut on the bottom of a, of a large diameter branch and then take the second cut above that cut so you can drop that branch to the ground so all that weight isn't pulling down on your final cut. And that's what they mean about taking double cuts. And here's a picture of, uh, if you look at um, the A1 area, you don't want to be cutting that angle where it says no. The A1 is a yes. You want to stay down, or excuse me, the A2 is a yes. Sorry about that. But you want to stay down, and you want to go right on top of the collar of the, of the tree. So you just want to go right above your collar, make your cut, and follow that collar right down. Do not cut into the collar because that's going to end up causing problems with the tree. And you don't need to paint. The tree will self-heal and when you cut that collar or cut above the collar it's going to callus over and it'll heal itself. Okay, Gary, I think we're ready for the next survey. All right, as we're starting to prune, what type of pruning cut takes a branch all the way back to the origin? It's either a heading cut or a thinning cut. Go ahead and make your pick and then submit. Okay, 10 seconds. All right, great. Okay, the type of cut, 67% of the people said a heading cut, 33% said a thinning cut. Okay, the answer is the thinning cut is the cut that takes the branch all the way back to the origin. Okay, there's two types of pruning cuts. Thinning cut, cutting out a whole branch or shoot back to its origin. A heading cut just takes off part of a branch. So you're heading the branch. Uh, like if you're underneath a tree and the branch gets in the way, a lot of people will just take off what part of the branch gets in the way as you're cutting the grass. So they'll just head cut that branch. That's usually when heading cuts take effect. Okay, thinning cuts. Thinning cuts open up light channels and air circulation. Because once you make that thinning cut, cut 
it's going to eliminate that branch all the way back to the main uh, trunk of the tree. It also increases your fruit production and quality. Okay, here's a, some samples of thinning cuts. The tree on the left is the tree and as you're looking at it, and then the tree on the right, the red marks on the, on the tree itself are the branches they're gonna take fully out and they're gonna take it all the way back to the main, the main trunk of the tree. So that's how you would do a thinning cut. You're going to take that branch all the way back and take it out. Heading cuts are different. Heading cuts will tend off or tend to close off light channels and it's going to reduce your air circulation. And the reason being is if you, if you make heading cuts, you're going to make the tree into a bush. So as you're cutting that, making that heading cut, it's going to send other branches right out from right below that cut and it's going to decrease your fruit production here are samples of heading cuts the tree on the left again is as you're looking at the tree and then the tree on the right the red marks are where you're taking the cut back to and as you can see you're not taking it all the way back to the main origin you're just taking off that branch partially so that's the difference between a heading cut and a thinning cut so your thinning cuts are the ones that you want to do the most of. Okay, thinning cuts versus re uh, heading cuts. Here's the results. Okay, you have a thinning cut. You're going to take that branch all the way back. A heading cut is you're going to just cut it off. Okay, if you look down below, these are what's going to happen to that tree as it grows. So the bottom one on the left-hand side of this picture, you can see they, they took those two branches off. And as the tree matures, you can see what happens to the tree as it sends out more shoots going out, more scaffolding heads out that way. And that's why you want to do thinning cuts. Now, if you look on the right, if you do heading cuts, they made three heading cuts on that tree there. And look how much it's uh, got convoluted with the different branches there as it's matured. So that's why you want to avoid heading cuts. Eric, can I ask you a question? Sure. Do you increase apical dominance by doing a lot of thinning cuts? One more time. You increase the apical dominance in trees, you know, the everything growing from the top. Well, you're going to prune the... You're going to prune the top heavier, and then, then the because you want to keep it looking um, tree shaped. So you prune the top heavier and follow it down. So as you're going, um, when you're scaffolding your tree branches out and you're shaping them, that's how you form your uh, get your um, oxen's moving through the uh, the tree. So as you're forming your branches and your scaffolding, that's what's causing your fruiting to occur. But you want to make sure that when you prune out, if you do a heading cut, it's going to send a lot of um, uh, nutrients to that branch and shoot out more branches from that heading cut. So that's why you want to do more thinning cuts. Did that answer your question? Uh, sort of. I'll ask you. I'll ask you at a different time, though. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Pruning strategies should take into consideration uh, your fruit bearing. Okay. Here's that slide I told you you're going to see again. Walnuts produce fruit on the current season shoots. So if you start taking these shoots out, if you take old shoots out, and you just leave new shoots, you're not going to have any fruit production. So that's why you have to be aware on what the tree produces and where it produ and what it produces on. Hazelnuts, nectarines, uh, peaches, quince, and Japanese plums produce on previous season shoots. Sour cherries, apples, and some pears produce fruit on the previous season spurs and shoots, and then apples 
apricots, sour cherries, sweet cherries, pears, and plums. Okay, so those are the things you got to remember. And that's why I say it's important to remember what kind of tree you got. And, you know, if it's a semi-dwarf, dwarf, or if it's going to go to a full-size tree. Okay, Gary, we're ready for the, I think, the last one. Is it a good practice to top a tree? Yes or no? Okay, 10 seconds. All right, very good. 87% said no, 17% said yes. The correct answer is no, you don't want to top trees. Okay, the bottom line, why you don't want to top trees? It's never a justifiable practice. It increases tree health problems and is aesthetically unappealing. And we're going to show you some good pictures here in a little bit. A top tree will require constant maintenance, and that's true. Because if you top a tree, the tree is going to send out a leader, and it's going to try to, or, or multiple leaders actually, and try to regain the height that it originally does. Okay, hazardous trees become a liability. Certified arborists and other legitimate landscape professionals do not practice tree topping. There are acceptable pruning techniques designed to keep trees away from power lines and other structures, and there's also um, acceptable, acceptable pruning techniques to maintain your height of the tree also. Okay, the problems caused by a tree cannot be solved through acceptable management practices. If the tree is going to go too big and you can't maintain it, you're better off just buying another tree and starting from scratch or remove and remove the tree. Just think about the mature size before you go and figure out where you're going to plant this thing. Make sure it's not going to interfere with anything. Make sure it's going to get good sun. Make sure the tree is in a good site. And this is all from Linda Chalker Scott, and she's one of our WSU um, representatives. And this is where I got that information from. Okay, here's some pictures of pruning gone bad. And you're going to laugh, but you I, I can guarantee you, you've seen these trees somewhere before. So here's somebody that's done some tree pruning along the side of an apartment building of some sort, and they just cut the tree way back. Now, here's what that tree's going to probably, some of those trees that you've cut way back, here's what they're going to end up looking like as you go. You can see all those heading cuts have just reproduced many shoots. That becomes a pruning nightmare. So when you start pruning, it's best to prune properly and, and prune it correctly. Don't avoid, avoid the heading cuts and make sure you do thinning cuts. Okay, we're going to get into a little bit of fertilizing. The micronutrients, or the primary nutrients, excuse me, are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Make sure that you watch what the soil needs and the tree needs before you do any fertilizing. Make sure you test your soil. The tree will tell you if it needs fertilizer, believe it or not. Most gardeners use a complete fertilizer, an NPK, and we're going to show you a little problem with that if you keep using a complete fertilizer, 
We're going to talk about that in the next slide. But if a tree has a 12 inch to 18 inch growth in a year's time frame, the tree's thriving. It probably doesn't need any kind of fertilizer. So the tree, like I said, the tree will tell you if it's growing greatly, you probably don't need fertilizer. Okay, the NPK, the nitrogen, just think of it as up, down, and all around. Nitrogen is up. It's going to do the greens, all the leaf coloring and the amount of leaf and all that stuff. Phosphorus is going to deal with the roots. And potassium is going to deal with the, circula the, the circulatory system of the tree. So when you go to the store and you see NPK, that's the easiest way to remember, up, down, and all around. So nitrogen up, that's the leaves. Phosphorus down, that's the roots. Potassium is the circulatory system of the tree. Okay, using complete fertilizer. I said we were going to talk about it. Here's what happens if you use it year after year. You could possibly get a buildup of uh, phosphorus and potassium. So that's where you have to be careful. Just make sure you test soil. I recommend testing about every two to three years and find out what the tree needs. If the trees, the tree will tell you if the, if the, if you're not getting good growth, chances are you need to give it a dose of uh, fertilizer. And boron's an important micronutrient that is sometimes not too much observed. However, that's what it looks like if you buy it. And if your fruit has any kind of looks or looks like this, has browning in there, that usually tells you that your, your tree needs a little bit of boron. And it doesn't take very much. A tablespoon of borax to two gallons of water, but you want to make sure you check before adding. Fruit thinning. I can't stress this enough. If you thin fruit, when I first started doing this, I started in the Master Gardeners in 2014, and I had all these apple trees. And it just kills you to thin a fruit. Because you think, oh my gosh, all these apples, I'm going to thin it out and throw these apples away. And I'm just wasting the fruit. But you're not. If you thin your fruit properly, the apples that are there are going to get bigger and you're going to have a better, um, you're going to get more produce. So important. it's an important part of orchard management. Improves the size and quality of the fruit. Ensures an adequate crop for the next year. And here's the three ways to thin. Picking the tiny fruit or blossoms by hand. So you're going to go through, pick out the smallest fruit and pick it away. Mechanical thinning, using a tool to knock off the fruit. My trees are about 15 feet tall, so I use a... Um, a fruit picker and it's on an extension pole that goes about 15 to 16 or 15 foot tall and I can just reach up into my trees and pick the fruit makes it very easy or knock them off and thin them out and you can also do this by um, using a hand pruner and just pick away at them and snip them off and another way method is uh, I've seen people I've heard of people spraying I don't spray but you can spray and it does growth regulation and it'll drop the fruit premature, it'll drop some of the fruit away. Fruit thinning. Apples remove the smaller fruit. The king bloom is the middle blossom or fruit and produces the largest. When I thin my apples, I just make sure that none of the apples are touching each other. And I'll pick away, so I don't want those apples to touch each other, so I pick away the fruit in between there and keep them open so I get good circulation and I prevent apple maggot and coddling moth from getting in the fruit that way. So you can see that's a nice little bunch of apples there you want to prune away so they're not touching and just thin them out a little bit. Asian pears. 
and regular pears. You want to save the middle uh, bloom and remove the rest. Roughly two fruit per spur. So this one here you just want to pick away and only leave two fruit on that spur. Peaches are kind of easy, four to six inches from each other. Just take your finger, your pinky, and your thumb and put it between the peach and there you go. Prune out or thin out everything in between. Other fruit doesn't necessarily need thinning. Could you imagine trying to thin uh, cherries? That would be a pain. Okay, weed management. Weed management is pretty easy around trees. Usually when a tree branches out and the limbs grow out, not too much stuff grows underneath of it. If you have a weed problem, usually the tree's rooting system will overpower the weeds and it'll get the nourishment it needs because the roots are so deep. If you're going to do any kind of weeding, just make, recommend doing hand pruning or hand pulling. If using a spray, make sure you read the label and make sure you don't spray when the fruit's going to be picked and make sure that it doesn't harm the tree. Mature trees will usually surpass the weeds for nutrients. As I said, it's not usually that necessary because the weeds don't grow very big because of the, the leaf and the shade. Okay, insect management. Insect and disease management will be covered Wednesday, the 20th of January at 6 p.m. So that's why I'm not getting into too much on the insect and disease management portion of this. Vertebrae pests. Birds, you want to use, like if you have cherry trees, small cherry trees, you want to net. Visual, audio, scare tactics, sometimes work, sometimes not. Dogs work well. Rodents, trapping and remove habitat. Uh, voles eat the rooting system and bark. Deer, you want to use fencing. Deer repellents sometimes work. Human hair, animal scents, hanging soap. If you want to keep the deer out, fence them. And then you got to watch the kids. They love the tree, the fruit. Harvesting. The best method to know when the fruit is ripe is to taste it. I, I have a, ref, a refractometer I use. I've tried it. I bought one. They're about $19. There's a picture of it. Um, okay, it has a brick scale, reads in degrees. Increments mean one gram of sucrose per 100 grams of solution. And there's a scale. If you look up any kind of fruit, it gives you a scale by the bricks and it tells you how sweet the fruit should be to pick. And that's what a bricks, that's what a refractometer looks like. But I, like I said, I usually taste it. I tried this refractometer. It works pretty well. You just uh, get a little bit of the um, juice on it, and then you hold it up to the light, and you compare the scale, and it gives you a reading. It's very, very easy to use. Handling. Fruit continues to ripen after pick, so pick before ripening, especially pears, and plan to store. Okay, so apples, I've got two Chehalis apple trees on my property, and they produce very well. I keep them pruned very, I, I prune them all the time now. These were the ones that weren't pruned when I got here. So finally, I got them looking like regular apple trees, and I continuously prune them every year. So last, last, last two years, I've had enough fruit that I am eating until January and February that I've harvested on, off these two trees. So right now, I've got two bins of uh, fruit stored in my, out my uh, garage refrigerator that probably has about five pounds of apples, maybe, oh, no more than that, probably about 15, a five-gallon bucket of apples per drawer. And I still have two left in my garage refrigerator. 
So I eat approximately an apple a day when I, I do smoothies every morning, Monday through Friday, thanks to Debbie Aldridge. And I've been drinking smoothies for about four years, but my apples, I'm still using the apples that I have picked from my orchard. You just have to store in a cool place and gently handle picked fruit so it does not bruise.